following discussion is not necessarily the views of all involved. The goal is to start open and honest discussion in the Christian worldview. Like all things, weigh what you hear with what you know and join us in our pursuit of the truth. Enjoy the podcast. The best way that I think explain this is demons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're at almost an hour, and we're just bringing up the fish. There are going to be so many angry listeners. <laughs> Don't you see? We're doing what Jonah does, barely talking about it. Yeah, God tells him, Joe, yeah, and he says, Jonah. Holy moly. <laughs> you can cut that out. All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Second Rate Saints podcast. Um, I am your host, Caleb, and to my left is... I'm Joel, and to my left... I am Colton, and to my left, uh, Joshua, um, and to my left is uh, Caleb again, because we're going in full circle. Anyways, hey Caleb, what have you read today? Well, I, 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 I haven't read it today. To be fair, actually, I didn't read it. I audiobooked it. Oh, doesn't uh, count. Learning from just listening? <sighs> Sounds lame. For our audio listener, I'm not trying to offend you. <laughs> <laughs> but I listened to a book that both Josh and Joel have physically read, I believe. Um, Timothy Keller's Reason for God. I have spiritually read it. You have spiritually read and it. And I did also audiobook it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I the only one that reads? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It reminded me a lot, like a lot of mere Christianity. Yeah. Um, okay. It has a lot of apologetic aspects. A lot of like, hey, this is this is the basic core. This is a basic core in Christian thought and understanding. Yeah. Um, it did seem a little bit more like, hey, this is a mere Christianity for today's audience. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah. yeah. And from a guy who is like a theologian, he's a pastor first, then a yeah. theologian. Yeah. Which yeah. which might be the right. Um, the right type of person to write a book like this. Yeah. Um, I like Timothy Keller. I've listened to his sermons for a while. Um, he doesn't always knock it out of the park. Like, it's not like, ah, he's, everything is a 10 out of 10, but he's consistent. But he doesn't miss. Yeah. That's the <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, he's uh, he's a pastor in New York, was one of the most diverse, large churches in New York, um, Presbyterian. Yeah. But um, mindful and willing to cooperate with other denominations yeah. Um, to put forward the 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 whole the Catholic quote unquote in the traditional sense um, Christian teaching and it's it's cool I really I really liked it I think my favorite part was how he he talks about uh, the sociological elements of uh, Christianity and the uh, the weaknesses and problems in our own society and where and how Christianity answers them mm -hmm. okay so is it mo is it more of a as someone who has only spiritually read it and hasn't <laughs> actually read it, uh, is it kind of like a... You're saying spiritual you, realities aren't true? Well, does it make... We're going to need to skip over this one, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's another debate. But, Caleb, does it have... Well, actually, all of you, any of you, um, when you say it's a modern version of mere Christianity, is it because it tackles modern concepts that weren't around back then or because it has a different kind of focus? Um... I think because it presents, its motivation is the same, I think. Okay. Um, but the issues and obstacles that get in the way are different from the 1940s mm. right. to today. Um, and we're not at war with Germany anymore. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and to a certain degree too, like when C.S. Lewis writes, at least to the audience that he's writing, mm -hmm. um, it's not a question of which God is real. It's if God is real, it is the Christian God, period. Mm -hmm. Where that is not the case today. Okay. And so he tackles that that aspect. And I think that's just kind of indicative for the whole for the whole book. Is there's there's it reflects modern issues. Um whereas C. S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, it dealt with different issues. Okay. Issues that are not as relevant today. Um, but I think that it still tries to tackle the same question and serve the same purpose. Um, would you then say it's more apologetic rather than explanatory or is it kind of both? I'd say it's both. Okay. Like it explains what the gospel is and why you should believe it. Um, nope. 
No? Exactly, because it's the reason for God, right? So he's focusing more on why God is important for society, not so much on why the okay. gospel is important for society. Um, I think, <clears throat> at least from my reading. Okay. I I thought there was some aspects of it that were that were less apologetic as well. But okay. I think he was saving that more for, what is it called, uh, the sequel to that? The, it's making sense of God. Yeah. That's more of the, the human response to religion. But you're right. But the uh, it gets into the gospel in the last quarter. Yeah. But that's that's it. I okay. mean, from my, like, I listened to it over the summer. Um, <clears throat> but one of his things was, uh, oh, shoot, I just lost it. Oh, one of his things is you already believe in God, is one of his yeah. ideas he puts forward, which I think is interesting. An interesting case for evangelism is, oh, you already believe these things? And then he takes the modern world's, um, not obsession, but uh, kind of implied social justice, right? The value of humanity, the right. um, you know giving to the poor, taking care of the, the widows yeah. and orphans, right? And he goes, you already believe these things. You believe these are good things, and this is the reason why God, right? Mm. I don't know. So when you say, like, dealing with more modern issues, it wasn't really an issue when Mere Christianity was written right after... Not right after. It was on the radio during World War II, is that right? That's correct. And then it was written afterwards. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's more of a modern take. It has less theology in it than mere Christianity and more apologetics. Like, it's a different ratio than mere Christianity. Um, but I think that it still tries to cover that same that same drive. A fun book I'm sure we'll cover soon at some point is uh, Reasonable Faith. Would you compare it kind of to that? I haven't read Reasonable Faith. And that, as far as my understanding of it... Yeah, my understanding of it is it actually attempts to be unapologetic, like exclusively, where this does not. And reasonable faith, as far as I'm aware, is more to be read by Christians, where this attempts to be also palatable okay. and approachable yeah. by more specifically agnostics, but atheists too, to a degree. That's very interesting. Okay. Timothy Keller does a great job at just speaking plainly to people, whereas C.S. Lewis is a very high-minded like intellectual individual so he speaks in like big terms and and like tries to present that down to the yeah that is his struggle person. and i think i think he's yeah. good at it for the most part yes but if you read some of his some of his stuff that he doesn't try to dumb down and you're like oh yeah. okay but timothy keller being a pastor does a really good job of just speaking the way people talk mm. um and so when you read it it, it you just cruise through the book yeah. because you're just it's so easy to take oh, that's, in, that's whereas good. with C.S. Lewis, you're just blown away by every paragraph that it's just like, I need to sit down and <laughs> think admit, about, about that. Um, I will admit that was my experience with New Christianity. Yeah. yeah. It's, it should be noted that uh, actually pretty soon we'll have uh, Timothy Keller's Reason for God on our short book review section on our website. Mm -hmm. Um, is this the first time we're mentioning the first about the time we're mentioning it? Oh, um, this episode will come out a little bit yeah. later, but yeah, we, um, on our webpage depends if you're on the phone or on a, uh, on a desktop, but if you're on a desktop, you'll see just below like the, on the home screen, you'll see the main box that has the quick links to different pages. And then just below that, you'll see a thing that's called book reviews. If you're on your phone, it will be, I think it's the same. It's just underneath as well, right? No, it's part of the whole, uh, right. Listing. Yes. Um, yeah. Where it's just, we give ideally two, three to five sentences on it and then a star rating and a link to where it is on Amazon. So yeah, check that out. Um, if you're yeah. looking for a good read, that's a place to go. It or a bad read. There might be a few bad ones on there, too. It should, yeah. it should be noted that we tried to make it a Halo system, one at, like out of five Halos, but it wasn't an option. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Josh was like, this needs to be Halos, and I'm, I was there trying to figure it out. And, and then it just didn't work. It, no. <laughs> the, you know, the, the, man tr the, the people try, and then the man just stops them sometimes, you know? Well, it's also a way that if you like, you missed what we said or what, what book um, we were reviewing, you can go and be like, "Oh, they were talking about yeah. X, Y, Z, or whatever." Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's "Reason for God" by Timothy Keller. I would recommend it. Um, you'll get a little more of our thoughts and a rating on the three of us that have read it on the book review section. So yeah, that's recommend it. Give it a read or audiobook it as Joel and I have. It's it's worth it. But yeah, we get to move into today's, to into today's topic, which is Jonah. 
Old Testament minor prophet. Yep. I'm excited. Never heard of him. Jonah was a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you mean the guy from the VeggieTales movie? Yeah, it turns out that's oh, in the Bible. An asparagus. Wow. It's based off of a true story, maybe. <laughs> well, that's what oh, we're see, about to get into, right? Seeing how we're going to start there, let's start off with genre then. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um... Because I think all of us have read, as Colton has mentioned before, actually, all of us have read commentaries that go in very many different directions with genre. Some sticking to, now. Nah, this is like recorded word for word as it happened for sure. And Jonah is the author. But, but Caleb, isn't the book only like four chapters long? How many different opinions can there actually be? A lot. Actually, if you look at, uh, there's a uh, resource that I have called the Net Full Notes, Full Translator Notes Net yep. Bible. Um, which is just the notes on different verses on like, hey, there's a trans, there's this translation. Difference. Yeah, this is like, uh, this is difficult to translate. And this kind of is, yeah. this is what it could mean too. And like, just on Jonah, it's so many notes. Yeah. yeah. You compare it with like Micah, which has like a small section and then 15 pages of notes. Yeah. Maybe not that long, but it's, it's wild. Almost. Um, and so even in the effort to translate it, there's a lot of their struggle, let alone interpreting. Um, so it's a complicated and it's a complicated work and everyone has a lot of opinions. Um, but with genre, at least when I've read it, I've concluded that it's didactic history. That's my answer. What does that mean? Didactic history means the, rec the person recording it, which I don't think is Jonah. Uh, we can get into that if we want, when we get into more authorship and date next. But the person recording it has a very specific point in mind and they are going to tell history in such a way that that point is communicated but the the teaching comes first and so history is emphasized differently certain parts that would otherwise if you were recording like exactly what happened and whatnot um like if you were recording the story of jonah you would conclude with what happens after jonah's sitting there but if it's, your, if it's specifically for teaching, you'll end it abruptly and not give any resolution because it's supposed to, hey, what? You're I want supposed you to figure it out. Exactly. Yeah. And so its author is presenting it as a historical work, but with a very specific function in mind. So that's why I went with didactic history. Okay. Um, what have you guys heard? See. I agree with you, just to get that out of there, because I know okay. you're going to argue with me. But I have a great respect, I think, for the satirical interpretation. That's satire. Can you explain that? Um, the main function of the satire in Jonah, as presented by commentators, would be that it's make not necessarily making fun, but trying to correct by exag hyper exaggerating uh, Jonah's like eth ethnocentralism of okay. of the not the gospel that comes later of the Jewish message and this idea that God is their God and not others, that he is, that it's all the foreigners who act right. He's the one who acts wrong. There's this exaggerated things that he does compared to what the others do. Um, the uh, emphasized nature of, th of events that seem pretty crazy and almost poetic, but not quite um, seem to lean towards that from what I've heard. What do you think? I don't fully get this the satire point mm. like I, I i don't see how an exaggeration of the story makes it more valid the the idea is that uh also jonah, what points are exaggerated right it, it's the idea that jonah is portrayed so negatively that's almost made making fun of him to show that that's the wrong way to live that he's so uh focused on the on him being better than everyone else mm -hmm. and the jews being better than everyone else is usually how some people bring it um, that it's supposed to make you go, oh, that's the bad way to live, especially since God's against them pretty much the entire time. Um, I've heard it's, uh, it was used as not pro propaganda is the wrong word, but as a, almost a parable to, uh, show that living like that is wrong. And this is why look at how Jonah acts. Isn't he so silly? That kind of thing. Any words there? Um, the non-idyllic prophet. He's the only prophet portrayed in a really negative light, as far as I'm aware. Like, really negative light. At least in the, the 12. Technically Saul. <sighs> yeah. He's listed among the prophets. It's true. <laughs> he also does a seance to bring back Samuel, so... Yes. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. 
Okay, that's a little bit of a confusing point. Yeah. The Sims um, was real. Anyways, we'll. Get I that think later. the I think it, King Saul, by the way, not Saul Paul. Yes. Paul I Saul. I lo I think the the most weight is behind the didactic, um, interpretation, the didactic history. Um, but I don't think the satirical elements can be ignored. No, well, I think the satirical elements, I don't see how that's in contrast to the didactic history. Yeah. Because I think and, if, uh, if it's history told yeah. in a didactic or re re rhetorical yeah. method, it will use, um, well, teaching methods. Yeah. Such as, Absolutely. In, such as exaggerations, such yeah. as... But uh, if it is satirical, you're, I absolutely agree. But when did it change what the overall message of the story is? Or at least the main one? How so? Because uh, if it's didactic history, what would you say is the main teaching point? Just actually, do, 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 uh, I have it in my notes, but my, this is a different page. So I'll fire from the hip. Do it. Um, it's that God is God over all creation, and He will act according to His attributes, regardless of who resists. Right. It is His. He's He's Lord over all, and His attributes. He acts. In his attributes even to those who are not in an exclusive covenantal relationship right see i agree with that and i think that's a really interesting one that we'll go into later on but the uh the satirical one then focuses on jonah specifically and his action and his rebellion and his uh bad profit hearing sure i, I that's think the wrong word i think though it's, it's, <laughs> it's <funny>. i think <laughs> profiteer um i think it's interesting then that if if that's the case, if the main focus is to focus on Jonah, it's very interesting that God's question in 411 is not answered. Because the question, like the author of the book, um, has God asked the question, but then he doesn't record Jonah's response. Because it's about you. It's about the reader. How do you deal with that response? And so I don't know if it's about Jonah. Well, you're, you're right. But the thing, even in the satire view is that the open-ended question is supposed to be so obvious that you don't live like Jonah, what Jonah did. The, the open-ended question is you go, no, you're not supposed to act like Jonah. Um, because satire isn't just, it's not just parody, whereas parody is making fun of. Satire is for correction. So the open-ended question would be then for the teacher to take it and sh as basically like a proverb or a parable and show it to the people. This is how you don't live. Now it's on you kind of thing. You are the one to answer the question, and you know what the right answer is. Kind of like in what you're saying with the didactic, it just changes kind of what the message is. Uh, it would have the same message, it's just how it would be preached. Um, and so, I think I on this point, I think... have the, a different message, but... What, no. would, what would the message be in satire, then? Don't be an ethno-nationalist. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you're getting at in chapter 3, 4. Because then that... The, the message... The dialogue that God has with Jonah mm -hmm. doesn't reflect that. The dialogue is all about his character, about God's character. Right. That's the main contention in chapter three, four, and actually in four, it's actually revealed that that's the contention from the pro that causes the problem in chapter one and two, because mm -hmm. uh, Jonah responds, "Going, I know you're gracious, merciful, blah 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 blah, and that's why I ran." And so the whole issue, at least as if you're going to go off of what the text is trying to communicate, what it's about. If you're going to allow the text to influence um, its its own message, right. I think it's leaning at well, this is a this is about narrowing down God's not narrowing down, but interacting with God's characteristics, right? And a repair of, of bad conceptions of God characteris God's characteristics. I I think what to your point about sorry Caleb's point I gestured to 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 your point Caleb the. The emphasis being on God being Lord of all. I think what it, if we take Jonah um, in the fish, it's taught with this great fish, alluding generally many people believe to uh, a sea monster, Leviathan style thing, uh, a, a demonic monster that opposes the gods in the sea, the place where the gods are not. We will get back to that. Yes, okay. we will. Um, we're not leaving that there. Um, you've also got... Nineveh, uh, Nineveh, this great, exceeding, an exceedingly great city, as it says, mm -hmm. um, that is in opposition to God's people. Um, that is far away, but it's also large and extremely powerful. It was the dominant na nation in the time. Mm -hmm. You've also got Jonah trying to go 
the farthest way he possibly could mm -hmm. from uh, God in Tarshish. Possibly Spain. Possibly Spain. Some people think it was uh, uh, Carthage. Mm -hmm. um, but anyways, the point being is that he's... the If we're taking the satirical elements and understanding them as an emphasis used to the didactic history, um, I think what it does is it beautifully points out the the point you were making which is god is lord of all he's the lord of these the 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 beings and in the sea that oppose the gods he's the lord of israel's greatest enemy in a faraway land right. he's he's he he knows no bounds in his ability to bring jonah back from the farthest reaches of the earth um and so in that way the satirical elements are being used to correct not the the yes Jonah's response, but in doing so, presenting you God's character and ability in bringing this person from the far ends of the world through a fish to this great city to say one line. Yeah, you're doomed. <laughs> it's, the, it's over. Forty days, right? <laughs> right. And then and then the king of Nineveh is like, oh well, we must do everything. Don't don't even let the cows eat. We're fasting, right? Yep. Um, and I think in that way, it's using these satirical elements to present the character of God. That that was the other thing is that because Nineveh is just so quick to re uh, quickly yeah. ready to do it, it goes against the entire conception that Jonah has, showing Jonah to be even more wrong. That, sure. that's, but I think in correcting in God saying these things, God presenting this to Jonah, He's showing the world and the reader, and then by asking the question at the end making the emphasis on himself because the emphasis isn't on jonah like yeah. you were pointing out yep and so it i i can understand the the problem that the satirical interpretists point out which is that it changes it makes it about jonah but all the emphasis is that the satirical elements bring is to present how great god is yes but in that sense because i i actually agree with that mm -hmm. I, I do think so um i agree with the didactic history i think it's one more profound, but I don't think that should necessarily judge how we read something. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it seems to take in more of the book itself into account than just the specific points of character of Jonah and, and God and the Nineveh. It also includes things like the fish, which we'll get into, and includes, uh, well, I say, I say includes the fish. It kind of helps explain what's going on well, there. I think, I think what it does is it's the most, it's, it allows Jonah to present itself in its own words um in that it's about god it's about jonah's struggle with god's characteristics and then the open ended question is about how do you struggle with god's characteristics and so i think it's it's slotting it in that genre allows the text to to present itself the most rather than simply going ah oh, there's extreme elements uh there must be like an extreme you... satire type Okay, yeah, because I agree with you. Do you believe that there are satirical elements to Jonah? Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, I just, um, just, there's there's a, <clears throat> we'll move off of genre right after this, I think, unless you guys have something more to say. There's been a movement in the last 100 to 150 years to either mythicize, parabolize, whatever possible, to remove the story of Jonah from any sort of possible historical tale. And... It's it's not just a it's not just like a how should we put it? There's a drive to do that for obvious reasons. Men people don't get swallowed by fish and live for three days, right. um, and so that there's this a little bit of like well if I have to hold this up to scripture but I don't believe that this happens it has to be metaphorical or it has to be a parable or it has to be a you know uh, a, a, a satire uh, but a story but not literal um, even though the author does present it in a literal way which we'll get into. Well, why that's difficult, especially with the fish and uh, and the repentance of the city. But um, if we're going to move off of genre. There, I, I'm going to say one thing. Okay. So, some make a big deal out of Jonah being dove. Yeah. Does that some. fit into the parable? No. Okay. Not in my Does opinion. that fit into the didactic history? I don't think so. Does, yeah. does that mean anything? I don't think so. Okay. Jonah being what? Jonah is uh, means dove. Oh. So, some tie that into you'll find you'll find commentators really? that do that 
and this into some weird stuff or like making a parallel between not quite Gnosticism. It's not like this is the Holy it's not Spirit. Secret knowledge. Um, it's closer to tying it back to like Noah. And like sending off the dove. Oh, he is the yeah. mess- he is the the messenger that brings hope. He is. Yeah, he's cast from the ship. He right. goes and brings good news. It's like there interesting. Are, it, there's something interesting. there. It is more ties to Genesis one to eleven, which actually Jonah has tons of ties mm. to the pre Abrahamic um, account in Genesis. It's very interesting, but yeah, that's a. I don't think that there's an actual legitimate um, like connection that really builds a bunch of insight yeah. not that i've ever really nothing met. more than a nice nod i yeah. just imagine somebody yeah. listening and having that in their head and they're like oh they're not even talking about the dove thing i got this <laughs> figured out it's like no we know about the dove thing <laughs> <laughs> if it's yeah. a point it's such a minor one it shouldn't really be taken seriously not not seriously but it's not part of the story is that basically what you're saying um yeah it might be just a name okay yeah, yeah. um but that uh, does mean that it was a person in history or somebody. Well, who, we we're exactly getting into authorship and date. Yeah. Person in history. Jonah is mentioned. There's a prophet named Jonah in second Kings 14. Yeah. Um, those two aren't explicitly linked. Isn't Jonas the only book that doesn't have a title that in its start where, uh, one like Joel will have this is the vision of Joel or Isaiah or something like yeah, that. It just goes straight into the well, story. Well, it's, it's not a prophetic message is the thing. Right. It's a history account. Right. Mm-hmm. You, we can argue about whether or not that, that's actually historical, but it's presented yeah. by the author as a historical account. Right. But then does that lean into it not being written by the prophet himself? I th- think so. I think also that there's... Um, Second Kings 14 actually puts the prophet of Jonah in a very negative light. I think Joel's, not Joel, Josh has brought this up before. Yes. Um, furthermore, as you yourself, Colton, has mentioned, Jonah is not not presented well no. throughout it. Um, in and outside of. Yes. <laughs> Jonah. Um, but to your point that you brought up, the Micah and Jonah both start the same way. The word of the Lord came to blank. Hmm. So yeah, I, I don't hold to it that it's a that it's written by Jonah. Most um, modern scholarship doesn't. Actually, not just modern, older. Like I don't think if my memory is right, I don't think um, what's his name, Martin Luther. Okay. Uh, Calvin. I don't. It's not a. It isn't really a super important part, um, but it does affect how you think of date. Yeah, and maybe even genre. Maybe. Sure. Um, so. Jonah, like the the prophet mentioned in Second Kings, um, is based off of when he's mentioned and what king he's like during that lifetime, um, seven hundred and fifty BC, yep. and then we know the Jews categorized, like collected the minor prophets into the Book of the Twelve by two fifty, uh, by two fifty BC. Um, also, its placement in the Book of the Twelve, so like they have their scroll with the yep. different with all the books, is fluid across the different textual really? variants. Um, and some of them, if my memory is right, not all of them have one. So it's some of them, some of those books in the, uh, in the book of the 12, um, they would interpret as like, okay, so this, they, they, they interpret them pseudo together. Okay. Um, and like they build on one another's ideas. Like there's actually a big, mo- uh, social justice aspect in the minor prophets. Okay. Um, but, uh, Jonah interpretation appears to be, um, separate from the rest as though he's like yeah he's in the book but he's not like the theology espoused there isn't doesn't build on the rest of the minor prophets but he is tacked on um so we know that it's written sometime between 750 and two and 250 which Hmm. is a lot that's a small time period and the other jonah the one in kings is at the time of king jeroboam the second of israel the northern kingdom Mm -hmm. so it has not fallen to well, here's here's <clears throat> here's the three different time frames and what they mean. Those contexts. Um, so there's three, there's two major events, and then that categorizes it into three. There's from 750 to 725, which is before the fall of Israel, the Northern Kingdom, to the Assyrians. Yep. Yeah. Assyrians being the Ninevites. Um, there's the second one, which is between 725 and 587, which is when the uh, 
between the Assyrian and the Babylonian exiles. So the Assyrians took Israel, but the Babylonians haven't quite taken Judah yet, the southern kingdom. Uh, And then the third one is during the Babylonian exile after the Babylonians come in and take. Um, Any of those environments are plausible, although that kind of... Doesn't limit much. Yeah, it's, it's difficult. Although that kind of... It changes how the text would have been applied by its initial readers, but it doesn't change its core message. In either in either context, it is shocking. It would be difficult to read because the type of tortures that the Babylonian that the Assyrians did, the Babylonians too, but more specifically the Assyrians, um, was insane. Especially if it's in that middle time period, it means that the Ju- Judah saw what the Assyrians did yes. to their northern brethren, and then well, they were God's, terrified. Yeah. Exactly. And and then you have this document coming out going, hey, um, God's still kind, gracious, and compassionate, and he's still Lord of all the earth, and he'll still act as characteristics, even if we say, even if we put up a fuss, um, he's in control. Because it it also, if it's in the middle time period, and this Jonah saw that stuff, it gives credence to his anger. Yeah. um, For why he doesn't want to give these people the message that will seek forgiveness. But one of the big wrenches I've seen thrown into that idea is that because the Ninevites are portrayed positively, some people then say, oh, that's evidence that Assyria hasn't actually done anything yet. You can say that, but Assyria was absolutely horrible. Everyone there hated the Assyrians. There was never a time when Assyria yeah. wasn't doing something. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the other one, other one saying after, like during exile, because that was so far in the past and it was used as a yeah. thing. Then it was, again, that's going more to the satirical kind of um, camp. Uh, that I don't, I don't think happen. so because it, you, if it's done in the Babylonian exile, so that third and last, that final time period, um, it would mean that everything that they're saying about the Assyrians in the story the readers know that they're, it's being said about the Babylonians. Right. Um, the reason why God doesn't just wipe the Babylonians off is because he's gracious and merciful and mm-hmm. slow to anger. And he's king of all the, all the earth and still lord of even those who aren't in a covenantal relationship with him. What it does do if, um, if it's the, the didactic history and it's relating to the reader, what is your response? And it's given to a people of Israel that sees... Nineveh receive the message of, hey, repent now, or bad stuff happens, and then nothing bad happens because they repent. Mm -hmm. And then those people come and wipe out Israel, and God had sent them many messages saying, hey, repent now, or bad stuff happens. Mm -hmm. And then they didn't, and then they get this book that says, hey, look what happens. Well, I I think (laughs) it's the second time period in between when, so, the Syrians take northern Israel, Babylonians haven't quite taken Judah, southern. Um, is it, I think that's, it's hard to prove, but it has the most interesting interpretation. It means that um, the original audience would have read that and gone, okay, those who repent aren't wiped out. We have other prophets right now that are saying repent or the Babylonians are going to come. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, just read Nahum to figure out what happens to. We're gonna have another podcast on Nahum, but that does affect the dating. Is if if Nineveh hasn't fallen yet in Jonah, that's that's gonna be an issue for dating, won't it? Yeah, it's actually presented as a city that hasn't fallen yet. It says that great city, mm-hmm. and it doesn't specifically say that it's fallen. Um, it could, it could very well. Nineveh's terrifying. You ever looked into Nineveh? Yeah, Nineveh's crazy, especially if you go with uh, what's his name, Dan uh, the Carlin's Greek hardcore history. What's that Greek historian? Mm-hmm. Um, Xenophon. Xenophon. This, the walls that he describes. Now it's yeah. Greek history, so like whatever. What's the coolest version of the story? That's the one I'm writing down. Yeah. Yeah. The the way Xenophon describes it is the wall's foundation was 50 feet tall and 50 feet thick, right. and the wall on top of the foundation was 100 feet tall and 40 feet thick. I don't buy it, but cool. <laughs> and there were when Alexander the Great and Xenophon came across Nineveh, the ruins of Nineveh after hundreds of years of misuse. There were other cities that were in sectors of Nineveh mm-hmm. that had nothing to do with each other because the ruins were so big. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, because one of the theories is that it was so large not because the the walls were, were huge, but because they basically had nomadic 
uh, shepherds that would go yeah. around the city. And by the time they got back to the other side the next year, the, the grass would be grown back. Yeah. Like that's how sustainable well, it was. It was well, so and, cool. Well, and that's what's interesting about Jonah's reference to it. He mentions it takes three days to walk around. Um, he says it's exceedingly great, so it kind of gives credence to it's weird. Xenophon's, yeah. mm -hmm. but also um, it's reportedly, according to Xenophon, 18 miles, the wall is 18 miles around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. again, Greek authorship. <laughs> yeah, there's a guy named uh, Adolf accurate. Oppenheim that does a look at uh, Mesopotamian cities. Yeah, and he he takes the approach that it's the diameter, and that it is because that's how big the loop is for the shepherds, yep. and that there are fences there. And he goes, "I'm yeah. not really a wall, but whatever, <laughs> right?" Because we don't really yeah. have evidence of that. Yeah. But it's so cool. But either way, you know, throughout history, Nineveh is regarded as an immensely great and powerful city. Also, always at war. Yes. They would have fig trees in the streets so that their soldiers would be well fed if they ever had to leave the city at a moment's notice. Like, that's why they had fig that's trees there. Cool. So cool. Yeah. yeah. Especially considering what they did with people at, during the wars, but <laughs> yeah. Less cool. Throw um, figs at them. Back to Jonah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, did we figure out a date? No. Uh, okay. You can't be sure on any of the dating. <laughs> Every single commentator I read for this basically says it's between this time we can't really say for sure it's a fool's yeah. error in this four or five hundred year gap and you're like yeah. oh, okay <laughs> um it is interesting i uh, i think it was um kevin something young blood who wrote um the zomberton's new exegetical commentary of the old testament they also have a new testament version very good commentary um i believe it's him that gets into it. it's like yeah it's almost like jonah's stripped of its dating anything that could explicitly date it the name of the king the name of who's yep. reigning during yep. during uh jonah's time most everything is just stripped from it that you could try to date things it's very interesting and so he goes into that it's like it's almost as though the author tried to write it in such a way that it would always be applicable because the teaching is always applicable he's simply showing god's characteristics in one moment of time but that is always true no matter what. Right. And so he tries to make it as a universal message as possible, removing as many dates and date identifying markers as possible and having as many references to Genesis 1 to 11, further emphasizing God is Lord over all of creation, not just covenantal Israel. And potentially the timeless aspect to it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but to answer your question, you can't be certain. Yeah, it's going to be one of those three environments, and those three environments will affect the message a little bit, especially how it's applied by the first audience. Um, but the main core of the message is still the same. Do, yeah. Do we agree though that it's about Jonah, an actual person? I think so. Jonah was a real person who existed, went to Nineveh, whatever. Like, as yeah, the, I agree not, with all those points. As the story necessarily uh, unfolds exactly, because you know it kind of. Like you said, stripped of date, all that. It doesn't have the, the markers of just history. But was Jonah real, or is it just a parable? Like I know we. I think about Jonah, I think that but... it's historical. But to, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. um, I'm accepting I'm accepting a, a historical grounding simply because it's written in a historical sense. Sure. Um, I don't think that those who point that it is a parable or it is a mythological tale. Um, I find their arguments extremely weak, um, and as far as I can tell, the original author meant it, r r wrote it in such a way that it would be, in compared to the rest of Jewish Jewish documents, would be assumed to be history. Right. So he wrote it thinking it was history. I think, still with a didactic teaching point in mind. Would it then fall in line with? Couldn't it fall in line with the idea of? Ecclesiastes, that there's many, if not most, scholars believe that Ecclesiastes wasn't written by Solomon. It just kind of claims the title of Solomon, the teacher. Well, I don't think I don't think Jerusalem. Jonah assumes it, Jonah doesn't even indicate that that Jonah is the author. No, but it's you, the idea of using a biblical character like Jonah, who was an actual prophet yeah. as of Kings, um, or Ecclesiastes with you, Solomon. You can to say get its point across. You can say that. Um, you could say that. Uh, you could say that the original author um, used Jonah and then made up a tale, and he's simply doing that for a didactic purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think the text indicates that. I think Ecclesiastes shows in shows an indication that he's like that he's toying with the idea of 
uh, Solomon as the author, to be honest with you. Um, just with the stuff where it's just like, there's, there's a couple, there's several in verses and places where it's like, ah, there's no one in the kingdom that can solve this problem. If it's Solomon, you, you, you could. Huh? <laughs> you're the king. You, right. You're the one who can stop the royalty from messing up anyway so but that's that's ecclesiastes we can get into that later in a later episode absolutely it's originally written in aramaic anyways continue uh, mm. there are some word plays that only work in aramaic interesting now anyways yeah, that's I, a thing found, I believe i found that as part of my research as well i i, I found the persian loan words and like the yeah, persian loan stuff words well that's stuff. fun well we're, now we're getting into ecclesiastes yeah. so let's move on um <laughs> jonah is the same as ecclesiastes that's the point. exact same book um before we get into the big, the big whopper of a topic, what's the what's whopper the significance of, of Tarshish? It's the furthest away that you could probably. You wouldn't be able to name a further place than that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, be, the, yeah. The New World. Britain. <laughs> Spain, maybe. Yeah. Is that what is that what it is? It's like over most Spain, most right? people think Spain, yeah. Spain, Spain or North Spain. Africa in Carthage yeah. area. Uh, that's what most people think, but mm -hmm. he must have been in Spain without the S. Uh -huh. Well, I'm in Spain without the A, so. <laughs> so I'm just going to give a quick overview from one to uh, from one to th the end of three ish. Okay. Because I think four actually houses the maj the core teaching of Jonah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we can dis uh, we'll go through an overview. We can discuss the stuff up till then, and then maybe we'll camp in four for a bit if you guys are cool with that. Sure. Sounds good to me. Okay. In chapter one, the prophet is called out to go to go to Nineveh. And it's interesting because he's either called out to uh, to go to Nineveh because the evil has come up before the Lord. That's one translation. Or another translation is actually, uh, God says, speak to them or it for their trouble concerns me. And either rendering is actually just as legitimate. It's either it's either the evil has come up before me or um, their trouble concerns me. Far more sympathetic. The second rendering. Interesting. Jonah then leaves the land of Israel via a ship of jo uh, in Joppa to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He actually expects to flee the presence of the Lord by leaving Israel. Jonah is a henotheist. Yes, <laughs> I think so. I brought that up yeah. to a couple of my profs and they're like, no, I, I'm still sold on it, but we'll get into that. He goes the op very opposite direction. So uh, he goes, I can't think, west uh, and Nineveh is, is, is northeast. Yeah. Um, God th hurls or throws a great storm upon the ship mm -hmm. um, and in the effort to claim the gods the sailors appeal to divination to find out who's guilty um, Jonah is selected by Lot and he tells them that he needs to be tossed overboard because he's a coward and doesn't want to kill himself because under the law they, he, that's not good anyway uh, <laughs> uh, as Jonah falls into the sea the ancient Near Eastern's common idea of the cosmic chaotic powers um, God appoints a great fish to swallow him uh, and hold him for three days. Um, then you go chapter two, which is likely an insertion. Um, probably not exactly what Jonah said right then, but is instead an insertion of a psalm um, overlaid that event. Um, the reader, the reader recites the psalm and learns the exact same lessons that Jonah was learning in that very moment. That Lord is over that. God is Lord over the seas, over Sheol and chaos, and that he, to him alone belongs salvation. Uh, Jonah experiences the mercy of God in what can only be called the closest thing to a Jewish underworld type experience. Yeah. Right? Uh, Jonah is then vomited up onto dry land, and we are left to assume that he participated in some sort of vow taking and sacrifices at the temple depicted in that uh, psalm. Uh, some people... And you'll still see this a lot, actually. Some people will argue that he was vomited like right up out of the shores of, of Nineveh, even though that can't happen. Um, and that he somehow walked in when he still smelled like the insides of the fish. It, I mean, the VeggieTales Jonah movie kind of does that explicitly. Um, even if he's vomited up um, right outside, like if he's vomited, if, if the fish goes up to the Black Sea and vomits him out, he's still like over 200 miles from Nineveh. Yeah. Um, and it's more likely seeing how at the the beginning of chapter three god recommissions him it's more likely that he's vomited back up on the shore of israel yeah. he does his the the repentance the sacrifices to the temple which are indicated in the second chapter yeah. and then he 
is recommissioned again. Mm -hmm. Um, So chapter three uh, picks up after an undetermined amount of time. He's recommissioned. uh, But this time he actually does go because he's like learned his lesson. There's no escape from the prison. But he is reluctant. Oh, he's reluctant. (laughs) And also um, he preaches only a message of doom. Mm -hmm. Doesn't add room for repentance. He says one sentence. According, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's it. <laughs> That's it. You're done. <laughs> There's no hope. Stop. Uh, but despite hearing Jonah's message of dread, the king of Nineveh hears it, orders a citywide fast, including the animals, begins to mourn, and throws everything that he can upon the chance of the hope of the mercy of God. Um, and it's actually here where I think the main, the main core teaching of the text actually takes off in chapter 4. But before we get into chapter 4... Josh, you mentioned henotheism. Yes. What is that? How can how can he run away from the presence of God? And what does he learn? So, common to the Ninevites and the other uh, Semitic religions in the ancient Near East, there was, uh, except for Judaism, potentially specifically, um, there was this idea that there are many gods, like polytheism, but that the instead of you worshiping just any or all the gods... You worship the god that is located in your city. And when you went to war, Nineveh, against Babylon, your god, the god of your city, Nineveh, was fighting on your behalf against Babylon. And whoever won was because their god won the celestial battle or their god said, no, I'm not fighting. And so you lose. Um, Well, you even see that a little bit in in Homer's writings, right? Yes. The whole... yeah. yeah. Although there's way more complicated stuff going on there because yeah. Greeks are not easy. Yeah. Um, and so you get this idea that if you can, if you leave the city, you're outside of the bounds of that God's power mm-hmm. or outside of that nation, you're outside of the, that God's power. And Jonah specifically to not go to Nineveh leaves Israel to get away from God. Yeah. It's presence. Because he could have just not gone to Nineveh and stayed in Israel. Yeah. But he knew he couldn't do that. That's because that's where God is. Yeah. And I mean, if there's the temple at this point, then there is an actual presence of God in the city. It's not yeah. crazy for him to think that God is in the city because, you know, his temple is there. Yeah. And that, that was the Jewish thought, right? Yeah. So looking back on that now, in the age yeah. of Christianity, you're like, oh, but God's everywhere. You should know yeah. that. It's like and, not immediately obvious. Yeah. Well, and even though the 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 texts, let me God doesn't say there's other gods. Mm-hmm. God says there's, yeah, he opposes the idea that there's other gods. Um, I think in Deuteronomy, he calls them that they're, they're demons. demons. Yeah. yeah. Um, he expresses that he is the God that has created everything. Mm-hmm. So he, and in the story, he calls Abraham out of Ur, a city on the other side of the desert. Um, and so like you see in the story, Jonah shouldn't have this belief, but many of the Israelites did because of the influence of the nations around them and it shows up it shows right away he's not a great prophet is he (laughs) no he's even listed as a false prophet in the king's passage yeah if it's the same jonah because he tells jeroboam the second the sinful king that he's Mm -hmm. like no it's okay you're doing fine and then amos in amos Mm -hmm. tells jeroboam the second no you're bad and like that's the whole point of the prophet amos and so (laughs) yeah yeah um it's actually interesting because we have in extra Jewish texts, you have certain places where um, prophets, when they went to a foreign neighboring land, they would actually fill their some pouches up with dirt from Israel. So they would be like, no, my God's with me. And so it's, it's a, <laughs> a jar it, of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's an issue. But yeah, Jonah runs away. God's like, no, nah, uh. <laughs> nope. And he preserves life in the chaotic waters yeah um so if we want to both josh and colton have talked a little bit about this i've talked about this later but uh, could either one of you get into how does that the chaotic waters element especially even how jesus references the uh, the great fish um later on in the new testament how does that affect that how does all that get tied up together the fish the chaotic waters preserving life in the in the chaos it has no meaning. <laughs> we're at almost an hour, and we're just bringing up the fish. 
There are going to be so many angry listeners. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't, don't you see? We're doing what Jonah does and yeah. barely talking about it. Exactly. <laughs> um, so what's interesting is not only does he go the farthest way he can, he goes to the place that theologically in the other religions is the place where God isn't. Yeah. The God, place that God, opposes the gods. Yeah, God tells him, Joe, yeah, and he says, Jonah. Holy moly. <laughs> you can cut that out. <laughs> um. So when he goes to like like the, the sea is seen as the place where the monsters are, the demons are, the the thing the monsters that oppose the gods in Egyptian religion and or the place where Tiamat the the, the thing that is signified as Tiamat in the Babylonian religion, mm -hmm. potentially the god of Nineveh. Um and so you've got a place where not only does he go land wise as far away as he can, theologically he goes as far away as possible to this place where God has no power. But God's like, no. Yeah. The absolute chaos. Yeah. yeah. If God creates out of chaos, that means the chaotic water. Or yeah. creates out of the chaotic, chaotic waters, then going into the chaotic waters is going where God has not yet been. Yeah. And he's like, no, I'm already there. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. So cool. Well, it's, it's interesting because you, you have Jesus later on in the New Testament. He doesn't say big fish, yeah. great fish. He says, yeah, the sea monster that yeah. swallowed Jonah. And it, <laughs> which is, again, an allusion to the Leviathan, which yeah. is comes from tiamat it Anyways. would it would be it's not like a one-to-one -one, but the best way that i think that i've found to explain this is functionally speaking in the old testament mindset demons <laughs> yes <laughs> well, yeah yeah no no you're yeah. right um yeah. and so what does god tell jonah hey i can preserve life in the place that you think i shouldn't that no other gods are at in the belly of a demon yeah so do what I say. <laughs> but, well, it's, it, I mean, it's the same point presented in Job, mm -hmm. which is just, there's this Leviathan, this dragon at the end, and he's just like, it's, I've got it on a chain. It like, does what I want. Yeah. And then he even says at the end of chapter two, the Lord spoke to the fish <laughs> and then it vomited him out. Yeah. But it is interesting that Jonah doesn't use sea monster. It only says big fish and generic fish. Yes. Well, um, but Jesus does say sea monster. Just just so that the argument is made, because I'm sure someone will make it, um, does the fact that it's recording this very poetic idea of... I don't think it's poetic, though. I know, but it definitely comes off as poetic. This str idea of the chaotic depths. As, oh, okay. The chaotic depths as, like, and... Well, if a demon, if you want to interpret it as demon or the big fish, the thing where God should not be, does that point it to the the idea of it being more parabolic? That's not the right word. Of a parable than as a that actual history. It should be pointed out that the only fish that we know, the largest thing that a f fish that we think, yeah, um, large grapefruit. That's like the biggest thing that we know. Yeah, they're filter feeders. Like you can't get your leg in one of those. Yeah. Um. <laughs> So yeah, there's no there is no biological evidence that shows that this could happen ever. Mm. Um, the alternative reading, the theological reading that Josh I think put forward would be when it says God appointed a great fish, when Jesus says a sea monster swallowed him. S something I think you can go this way. I don't know what it means. S something s spiritual. I don't know. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I've been dying to talk about the fish thing. Okay, I'm you, gonna go take it, the take it away. I, I don't. You you can say you can say that uh, that it's not historical because of this, but it's not presented and it's not immediately obvious in the text. And also the first the not the first century the uh, the readers in the ancient Near East would not have read it that way as parabolical simply because of that. They would have still sure. understood it to be historical. Yeah, I think he's still just make using. I think he's just making theological impressions by using, like, yeah, the situation is the sea and this giant fish. I think it's a theological impression placed. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. But Joel really wants to talk about the fish. Because the biggest disagreements I get in with the, the Jonah stuff is hard and fast. It's got to be a, re a literal fish, right? And, like, the science is pretty conclusive. You it can't a sea fit bass. a whole guy in a fish or a whale can't do it and there was some guy in the 1700s that apparently was swallowed by a sperm whale which is a different thing than a filter feeder because he does Captain have teeth Ahab. 
Yeah. And it's, it's not like, grounded. And it's not super grounded. And there are photos, but they look very doctored. There's not a whole lot of evidence for it. You can go down that tangent. There's also like a, a mega fish kind of thing. I can't remember. What, it's Part of its name is literally mega because it's, it's extinct. Megalodon? And it's been extinct. No, it's not megalodon. <laughs> I was going to say. What? Jonah would be shredded. Um, not in like a good way. Sharks. <laughs> I don't know what's going on now. Um, but there was a, an extinct giant fish and uh, some in the creation science division of our oh, wonderful plesiosaurs. faith. <laughs> I've, heard di- I've heard dinosaurs. Dinosaurs? Yeah, plesiosaurs. I guess so. I guess. They have really uh, small necks, so obviously it makes sense. Does that make, does that make it all oil fish oil? This doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> No, That's going to land for one person if a thousand people are listening to this. <laughs> so, whatever. <laughs> Guys, I've looked into it. I've looked into the blogs. I've looked into Ken Ham's wonderful world of magic. <laughs> the, re- the real <laughs> sources. <laughs> the real sources. Real authoritative. <laughs> and, and I've yet to find a marine biologist that's like putting a stamp on it and saying, this man was in a fish. Anyways, thanks for listening to my rant <laughs> on the literal interpretation. It's not even literal. It's not even fair to say that because literal will be literary. It's not written anywhere that it's got to be Magnapithecus or whatever it is. No, that's an orangutan. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if God was in the brain of the fish steering it, is there a fish? Oh, yeah, right? for, for sure. Whatever. I think it's actually a submarine. Anyways. <laughs> I Here's the weird thing for me. The... The basic theological conception would still have held if God just miraculously held him floating in the water, safe to shore. Or he held onto a piece of debris, and God just preserved his life in in that. Right. Um, it would have been, like, the same theological point would have been, would have been stated. Maybe not emphasized to the, to the utmost degree, but it seems weird that you could have achieved the entire same theological point without putting the fish in there also the fish is mentioned in like two verses and the author doesn't really seem to care it's like yeah so this yeah, fish like, happens he and then doesn't boom. have ptsd <laughs> <laughs> big fish you know him anyways <laughs> it also should be mentioned uh, i didn't know if we when we were gonna bring this up that jonah is the most referenced book by jesus yeah outside of the torah i think it is which which does give allusion to another interpretation that when the fish swallows him he's dead he just dies and then yeah, he just gets res. He just gets brought back to life, like, like after the other prophets. Time after right, being brought yeah. down into specifically death. three days. Yeah, because three the whole, nights. Yeah, yeah. It's a thing. Yeah, I don't know. It's there. I've heard that idea. I mean, it, I, but I don't know. I think it. Like, if we're gonna take the data, fish eat them. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna go with something ate them. I, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Satan got hungry. Yeah, I didn't mean. I did not mean yeah. to say it like that. See, that's what I mean. You say you say that like ironically, ironically, yeah. and you don't. And I start doing it unironically. Yeah. Ah, uh, guys, I just found I found Ken Ham's article. It says he can totally swallow a whale. Can totally swallow a man. He can, yeah. Well, Ken Ham just is out of his mind. I wonder if he's done his research. He should do his research. Anyway, we need to move on because we've. Anyway. Well, well, and. Ken Ham really should listen to you because you're you're actually born on the sea. I guess not everybody loves Marine Land. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and moving on from our comedy. <laughs> now that we've uh, success thoroughly covered the fish, <laughs> not even close. Um, let's move on. Chapter four. Yeah, the big point. The big point. Jonah, the city repents. Jonah's pissed. Goes to the east of the thing, sits down, builds a booth, and is booth. Builds a booth. <laughs> <laughs> Lights up a booth. <laughs> builds, a, builds a booth, sits there and goes, hmm, and watches and waits for the city's destruction. Doesn't happen. Then he starts getting a little pissy about it. Builds a builds a ha- uh, builds a booth for him, mm-hmm. right? Little to keep him out of the keep him out of the <laughs> shade. And uh, it's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. So God causes a plant to grow, right? And then he's like, ah, oh, this plant's nice. This is good. This is super shade. Nice. It- it keeps him off from the scorching east wind. Also, okay, we won't get into it because we ac- we actually don't have time. There's so much wordplay in the last chapter. It's amazing. I tried to, I preached a sermon once on Jonah, and all I could do is like, guys, if you if you have time, look into the wordplay. It's so cool. So the God appoints a caterpillar to kill the plant. <laughs> um, plant dies, and then Jonah's like, ah, kill me now, right? 
which is the very words that he said initially when God was spared the city. He's like, I'd rather die. Mm -hmm. And then he, he goes, when the, when the plants are, when the plant is removed and he's in the scorching east wind again, and God actually makes the, the, the environment even hotter and worse for him, which is a play on his anger for wordplay with Hebrew. Anyway, um, and he's like, ah, kill me now. And he's like, really? You have compassion for the plant that you didn't cause to grow, that you didn't do anything. And you're just like, really? You have compassion for them, but not for Nineveh, which, you know, has a bunch of people. They can't tell the right hand from their left. Yeah. And the animals, which is interesting. Yeah. Should I just read the last verse? The last yeah, two sure. verses? Okay. Um, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? See, I, I have heard it said that those who right hand from the left, some people interpret that as just children, 120,000 children. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's actually what it's trying to say. It's just, I, as far as I'm aware, it's just saying that these people don't know. They just don't know. They don't they understand don't. the morality. They, they don't no right from wrong well the idea would be they don't have the law yeah um but the but the uh, there's an object lesson going on there actually i think it's john walton and actually a great many commentators and scholars point out that there's there's an everyone loves a good object lesson especially when they're the ones that are learning yeah jonah doesn't um but the idea is he builds a booth to shield him it's not sufficient it's not really worth anything it doesn't do it's not good mm -hmm. god causes the plant it's sufficient Right. right the people repent it's pathetic right you know like obviously they don't, they don't convert like he doesn't yeah. they're just like ah maybe we won't die if we try something yeah if it's historically <laughs> lined up with jonah it's like what three generations later with with, with Nahum? uh two agent one or two generations later yeah exactly exactly yeah um but the shallowness of their repentance like that's not really sufficient but it's because of god's mercy the plant according to to yeah. Jonah, but it's because of God's mercy mm -hmm. that He allows it. Like, okay, that's yeah. that's enough. I will, I will abstain. I, I'm not abstain. I will, I will not send the scorching east wind, or I will not destroy the city. And those are the two parallel things. And so there's a bunch of parallels going on there. And what it is is God has J Jonah go through this object lesson to then go, okay, what you want is for me just to wipe them out because what they have done is insufficient. Fine, I'll let. I'll give you your insufficient thing. Take down the plant. Your booth is not enough. Scorching east wind, you're dying from heat. <laughs> That's what you want. Mm -hmm. So which one do you want, Jonah? Do you want me to be consistent and not be compassionate, not be long to suffering, not be, not be, long, to, uh, not be long to anger and all that kind of stuff, all of his attributes, which Jonah lists, I think, two to three times in there. Yeah. Um, so he, he technically it's a rhetorical question to Jonah. What do you want? Mm. Do you want me just to be full of justice and wrath? No. Yeah. Well then don't complain when I have compassion. Right. And he, there's the challenge at the end there, which is left open for the reader, which is, should I not be compassionate? Yeah. And so the very same compassion that causes the offense is encouraged in the reader that would get over that offense. So it's yeah, like, like we said before, Jonah doesn't respond. There's no written response from Jonah mm -hmm. to that question. It's open-ended. Yeah. Well, it's in effect that uh, the compassion that causes um, and answers uh, Jonah's problem, like it's, it's mm -hmm. compassion is the issue that Jonah and the modern Christian will have with God's act of grace, right. but it is also the answer to that problem. Yeah. If we see people through the eyes of God. We will naturally have compassion in that 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 difficulty with with God's characteristic will go away. Right. Um, it's awesome. The Jonah's words specifically about God's character is this: "That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster." Yeah. He yeah. F five different ways he said compassionate yeah he wants nineveh <laughs> to die so much he'll run away so they don't get the warning so they just die well, right? yeah and in the historical context anybody who knew nineveh like the types of stuff that the assyrians yeah. would do it's horrendous yeah. um but god's like yeah but they're they're still people and they don't know their right hand from the left well i want to have compassion on them yeah. um rough 
Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because you'll hear sermons that are preached where it's like, you know, doesn't Jonah want everybody to get second chances? It's like, yeah, if you, but, but the message of Jonah is everybody gets second chances. Everybody. Yeah. Even the people you don't like. Yeah. Yeah. How are you going to respond to it? Yeah. And so it's, it's, uh, it forces the reader to go, okay, God, it, to focus in on God's characteristics and try to, try to value them and emulate them. I think, I think that's what's going on. Yeah. Also, don't be like Jonah. Yeah, but only because of all the previous things. Exactly. Yeah. It is interesting, though, that it it, uh, it uses the phrase appointed three times, and it's with the worm, the plant, and the fish. Yeah. And God appointed a fish to go to Jonah, and God appointed a plant to grow near Jonah, and God appointed a worm to take away the plant. Well, it does show that God's grace acts on an individual and national level, which is right. interesting. Um, and so that, like God's interaction with the, like, let's say the world politics is always, no matter what text you normally go to in the yeah. biblical, in the Bible, um, is always steeped in his providence. Yes. And so when he appoints, when he does, it's providence. Well, it's, and we don't like to hear this cause it's just like, I, this might be wild, but you've heard a lot of people during just after world war two say, where was God? That's when I realized that God didn't exist, or if he did, I don't like him. I think we talked about this in like first talked, one of the yeah, first three episodes. Why people, yeah, why people leave after World War One? Yeah. yeah, we the church didn't give a sufficient answer yeah. to that. To to why is there so much death? But it but that specific one because it's a it's a nation that is doing these horrible things to a people group, specifically the Jewish people, yep. like in Jonah. Um, and the the answer is people want God to rain hellfire down. On the Nazis, the, the the modern application of this, and I, I lightly went there in my sermon um, that I preached a while ago on this. It's Russia, right? Yeah. yeah, I I hesitate only because of its relevance to today. Yeah. Oh, it's touchy. Yeah. Like I'm not I'm not now about to go connect all the dots. Yeah. Um, and I'm not gonna start preaching that right here right now. But I will say, us in this situation. If you're going to be reading Jonah, the Russia is Nineveh and Assyria. Just there you for go. the modern context. Yeah, for the modern context, right. for the modern application of that message. Yeah. yeah. So, or pretty much anything you hate, really. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah, or any oppressive nation. Nation. Yeah. But yeah. are we good to start moving to the wrap stuff up? Because yes. I think I think I want to talk about. I want to mention our next episode. Yeah, let's mention the next episode, but uh, I, I've been thinking about a, a sacrifice in the Holy Cow or something. Okay. Um, Should we summarize everything that we've, like, wrap it up? Like, wrap up the Jonah. Okay, yeah. So. Where'd we land on genre? Uh, it's difficult, but it's between didactic and satire, and satire seems to be losing. And it seems to be kind of a mix <laughs> of both sometimes. Yeah. yeah, elements of satire meant to teach history. Yeah. There we go, didactic history. Um then what was the next thing we, we talked about the dove thing uh, doesn't eh. matter um throw author, that throw that out with uh ken ham <laughs> uh we learned ken ham really likes sperm whales and great whites and stuff and he thinks that that's what swallowed you authorship and date authorship probably not jonah who knows date 500 year period between 750 and 250 bc probably yeah every every author i've said has disagreed on that topic completely it's great yeah, yeah. um compassion yeah yeah it is the pro it is the s problem and the solution to jonah's problem god is the lord of all creation everything and he has compassion on whom he'll have compassion and wrath upon whom he will have wrath right yeah although that's not emphasized as much yeah in nahum it is it, which is our <laughs> next episode I still got to talk about something okay we'll, we'll talk about nahum with the next episode um what I was thinking about, we use didactic history now. And if you grew up in a Christian household, you probably watched the Jonah movie. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, much like the writer of Jonah in the Bible, the writers of Veggie Tales don't really care if it's historical or not. <laughs> right? What are we getting at here? I was just going to say when you're teaching scripture to kids, don't be so concerned on the historical uh matters or whatever but also 
don't make it a big deal. Don't try and tell kids it was a literal big fish. Don't try and tell them it was, it was a big old metaphor. Don't try and tell them it was uh, historical, but only to the author. <laughs> or, or the fish was a demon, maybe. Yeah, like don't tell them yeah. demon fish is coming for them. <laughs> yeah. It's not very cool. I think, yeah. It, let, it's very cool, but like... It's, it's, teach scripture the way it's meant to be taught, mm-hmm. appropriate to the age, appropriate to the time, place, and person you're speaking to. Like, cool. So that turned out not to be a, a, a holy cow thing or anything. It's just... Well, no, I, just, I mean, my sacrificing the holy cow, if we're going to go somewhere, I have one here. Oh, you're, you just want to get rid of veggie yes. tails? That's rude. Yeah. Also, Phil Vischer, if you're listening, please come with the podcast. Okay, cool. Yes. Um, Caleb, you had a holy cow. What was it? My holy cow is Jonah did not walk into Nineveh <laughs> smelling like a inside of a fish. I forgot about oh, that. We didn't even talk about the fish worshippers. Oh, man. Okay, no, 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 it's not. Uh, but it's, I like it. <laughs> um, even if the fish in three days went from the bottom part of Mediterranean-ish to the Black Sea and spat them out, which is the closest spot it could, it's still like... It jumped into the Tigris. Oh, I think it's old yes. enough that the, the whales still had legs. <laughs> Now I'm really right. I want both camps in this one, I think. Guys, I think we're spiraling. <laughs> anyway, my, my, my sacrifice to the holy cow is we need to just stop telling people that because it's just not the thing. He got spat up, back on land, sp- likely in Israel. And then goes to Min- Nineveh. Yeah, because episode three, not episode three, hold on. <laughs> chapter three. <laughs> chapter three is a recommissioning event. And so likely the whole concept is that was, that was a failed failure of Jonah. But God gives him the second chance. Yep. And so then it's a chapter three likely starts off right where chapter one had started. He gives him a second chance, just like he's about to give Nineveh. Exactly. I know, right? It also, we didn't have time. Also, it's not as interesting. But the uh, the structure of Jonah has arguably four chiasms within it. Yeah. And that I also two parallel structures, which show Jonah trying to leave and then getting brought back by God, then him going to Nineveh. And then God responding. Um, two different parallel structures that are emphasizing similar points. Yep. So, Nineveh's spared. Everything's good. Right, Forever. Joel? Until next time. <laughs> yeah. Um, when the Lord strikes, he will not have to strike again. And the fact he didn't strike this time is, uh, you know, only a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so... Nineveh really is as evil as everyone thought uh, it was in Jonah, and that comes out in Nahum, which if you want to do some pre-reading for the next episode, you probably have about three weeks to read three chapters in in Nahum, (laughs) Um, and you totally should, because it's not a book a lot of people get around to. It's got some wild metaphors in it, Um, not metaphors, more like idioms. It's a it's a it's a rich book that I wrote a paper on one time and it became my favorite minor prophet. So I think both Joel and I's papers will make it onto the blog. Um they're more specific looking they're like they're at the they're about the book in general, but they're also more about very specific passages in those books. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, they'll be up on the blog if people want to take a look. Yeah, I start talking about the March of Empires, so that might be a little off topic for what we usually talk about, but maybe. Yeah. But they'll, they'll be, be about yeah. Stuff. yeah it's cool all right i'd like to welcome not welcome I'd like to thank everyone for getting this far for struggling with us through jonah um and that we will uh reconvene when we talk about Nahum, and it will be um hopefully just as fun hopefully you were able to stay with us during our spiral moments um but yeah leave a like comment email us check out the blog check out the book review um and i'll see you guys next week